I would invite my colleagues in the panel to come up in a freestyle way. Freestyle. And while, while they take a seat and then uh, they will introduce themselves, let me just say a few words. I think that we are addressing CBDCs and stablecoin, and I think we are addressing the hottest topic in the Web3 space. Correct. I can give you an evidence of that overnight. A very famous politician in the globe said, I promise to never allow central bank digital currencies if elected. Last night. You can imagine who, who is. I should add let's, that he could have said, let's make coins and notes great again. No, he didn't say <laughs> that. So just to say it's very, it's very central. You, you have headlines every, every day about these topics. Now, just to set the uh, the, 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 ba the baseline here for all of us, uh, maybe I say things that are very obvious. CBDCs are central bank digital currencies issued by the central banks. They are digital, it's digital money, it's legal tender. It comes for in a wholesale form and in a retail form. There are many projects around the globe. We have here Morten, who is a specialist in, the, in this field, as in his function as head of the BIS Innovation Hub, while stable coins are issued by the private sector. Uh, they are not legal tender. They can ensure the transmission of value and so-called payments on the blockchain. They can intermediate payments internationally between, uh, between uh, legal tenders. Um, and they are basically out of tokenization. I think by, by heart, I think we have uh, a lot of stable coins out there, maybe 100. Uh, uh, but only two or three that dominates the market. Uh, CBDCs, we have a lot of projects out there, uh, far less, uh, far less uh, uh, CBDCs that actually exist in practice. What the, uh, uh, Rob said is, is correct. I mean, we are going to have a discussion here around uh, many, 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 many topics. You know, first of all, what is the reality uh, here um, in the world? With, for CBDCs and stablecoin. We can then address the use cases, the expectations. What do they promise? Are they fulfilling the promises? What is the regulatory approach for these two uh, uh, stablecoins and CBDCs? What are the challenges? And then in the end, of course, we will really try to address the question, what's next? I mean, are they cannibalized themselves going forward? Is uh, something else prevailing? Or is uh, a nice uh, virt virtuous Co collaboration between between both uh, CBDCs and stablecoin possible to deliver to the economy the advantages of better and more efficient payment system domestically and internationally. So I say that mm -hmm. I would like to that each uh, each panelist introduce uh, himself or herself. Maybe beginning with Morten. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, it's always good to come up and see Davos, even though I'm regretting that I didn't bring my skis. Uh, so my name is Morten Beck. I head up the Swiss Center of the BIS uh, Innovation Hub. Uh, I'm an economist. I've been in central banking for 20 plus years. So in, the, you know, for full disclosure, I'm probably more on the CBDC side than the uh, stablecoin side in, in, in this debate. Um, so what is the BIS Innovation Hub? Um, I think you would agree that Central banks and innovation, that might sound like a contradiction in terms, and, and I agree a little bit. I often say that we're a bit like a bumblebee, something that in theory shouldn't be able to fly, but I think we are off the ground and generally flying in, in the right direction, but I'll, I'll leave that final judgment to you after this panel. Thank you. Eve? Good. Thank you very much for the invitation, Mathia. Pleasure to be here with all of you. So my name is Yves Lanchon and I'm uh, working at Amina Bank. Maybe you heard about Amina Bank, but probably more about Seba Bank. We just rebranded, so please be used to that. I also need to get used to saying <laughs> that I work for Amina Bank, which is a bit weird, but anyway. And um, so I'm heading research and communication marketing over there. Uh, I, you know, in the debate of, uh, of uh, CBDC and stable country on both sides, because I started at the Swiss National Bank, so I'm a sort of central banker, or I was, and I moved to a crypto bank, so everything is possible. And I think probably as a Swiss, I would say that the solution is probably in the middle to be very, to start with the consensus, but let's, let's discuss it later. Jana, over to you. 
Hi, my name is Jonna Powell. I work at DTCC. I'm an MD in technology research and innovation, so I head up that department. There's three uh, main areas that we focus on as part of that. One is digital assets and Web3, one is data and AI, and one is emerging technology. So recently, uh, we publicly announced that we acquired Securency. That's extremely exciting for us, and we also just um, invested in Finality, which is going to help us with the cash leg of our settlements. So I think this is a really relevant uh, conversation to have to have today. Good. Kumar Dev, your background. <laughs> uh, thank you, Matteo. Um, a pleasure to be, first of all, a pleasure to be back in the uh, Crypto 2030 DWF house. Um, I was here on Monday uh, when, you know, moderating a panel and uh, I'm back here on Thursday. Sorry for my voice. It has been, how shall we put it, quote unquote, uh, interesting Davos so far and intense Davos so far. Um, I work uh, with different organizations. I have different hats, including this one. I, own, I have my own company. I'm the CEO of Blue Hat Founders and uh, we work very closely with governments um, and investment um, areas. I'm on the expert panel of Web3 uh, and Metaverse for Interpol, for Finland, uh, the Finland government that is, and um, various other organizations. I'm also an expert of the WEF for more than 10 years now. Um, and my focus for the last two, and, and for anybody who's from the Middle East, I was the director of emerging technologies for the first director of emerging technologies for Neom. I don't think there's been a replacement yet, so maybe it's the first and last. Uh, and uh, my focus on Web3 has been uh, for the last three years or so. Uh, I'm very happy to be here with this eminent panel um, today. Thank you very much for the introduction. We have really a wealth of experience here on the, on the panel. We have a lot of time or a decent amount of time, one hour uh, by and large, so we can really somehow take it easy and elaborate on things so that we we give value also to the audience. I think one preoccupation for me at the beginning in such topics is to do a reality check or offer the audience, including me actually, a, a reality check. Because we hear so many things, we have headlines every day around these two topics. And, and uh, it, is, it is, I think, useful to get to know from the expert what is actually the reality? How many CBDCs are there? How many projects? What kind of CBDCs? Are they, go are they being used or not yet? When will they be used? And on the stable coin side, same thing. How many really are out there? What kind of, uh, uh, of stable coins there are? Are they successful or not? Is there a monopoly or duopoly now in, on the market, etc.? I think I would do, again, this is a question for all of, of you. Maybe we, we reverse back f f first from you, your side first. So if you're looking at the reality check, right, um, and it's been a while since we've been discussing this panel, a lot of things have actually happened. And uh, what we, what, but if we want to underline that, what I see globally is that what started off as being an experiment um, or, or, or looked at experimentally has now become an option to be explored. Within. So, you know, we had small countries, uh, I'm not trying to say small in terms of, uh, just a small in terms of, let's say, economic size in certain mm. cases, who were uh, experimenting with CDBCs in, in, uh, in the Caribbean, in, in East, uh, Southeast Asia, and other places. Uh, we've had some dabbling with the uh, C CDBC concept in Europe, though that went, uh, in the, <laughs> that went pretty badly quite quickly. Um, and of course, we've been also looking at CDBCs in, uh, in Switzerland. I believe there's a discussion on going in Singapore, uh, even, even in Hong Kong. And I recently came back from, uh, well, recently, a few months ago, came back from a place called Sarawak, which is Borneo, which is a part of Malaysia, but they're semi-independent, let's say. And they were also looking at CDBCs as a, as a means of, um, uh, of, you know, in a certain sense, the treasury management, let's say. So, but is there today a CDBC and I'd like to defer to the, that's really a CDBC that's out there that you can actually go and use or uh, interact with as a uh, citizen, as a citizen of any particular country. You, really, I don't think so, right? Mm -hmm. I think there are attempts at this and different central banks are defining them differently. And some of them have sandboxes and you might be a part of that, but we don't have that reality. But that doesn't mean anything for me. I mean, for example, the ETF discussion with uh, not just Bitcoin, but uh, ETH and all that has been going on for five years now. Right, and we always said it's never going to happen. That's just not going to happen. And there were so many false starts. Uh, a Gemini brother, they tried to do that. Winklevoss brothers tried to do that. But ultimately, this is now reality. So I think 
I personally believe that the reality check is that we, don't, we are not there yet, and there are some serious questions to be addressed, particularly the exposure of central banks directly to the consumer, which goes against national law in many countries, including in Europe, which is why uh, in the, the ECB had to back off on that. But are CDBCs a legitimate tool mm. that central banks will use not only for uh, treasury management, but for other things, for example, refinancing debt on a short term, uh, I absolutely think we are going to get there. So I'm very bullish on CDBCs in general, and there are issues that need to be resolved. But I don't think we should look at them as a possibility. Uh, 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 I think there's more probability at this stage. And what, what, what's your take, what's the reality check on stable coins? Stable I'm coins, yes, stable coins, um, Let's start with the bad news. The bad news, as I'm sure you've all read, if you've had time during Davos, is that uh, the UN of all organizations, it's not an organization given to hyperbole at all. And they're very measured. They do a lot of research. They, they back their things up with data. The UN came out and said that the largest stable coin in the world, uh, our friends from Teta and USD, is actually the largest conduit of money laundering and the, and the platform of choice for criminal gangs worldwide, right? And it didn't say that about any other coin or, or Bitcoin or, or, or the alternative coins, but they said that about a stable coin. And they said, well, stable coins are actually, and the whole, if you read the report, it says basically stable coins uh, are that perfect in between. You don't have the, the KYC, or not even the KYC in this case, it's more AML and, and, and uh, other checks that you would have if you tried to move the US dollar around or any other uh, actual fiat around. Uh, so you don't have that. At the same time, you have the same more or less value. You, can, you look at USDT as being US dollar plus minus, right? Yeah. That's kind of where it is. So that's the bad news is that this is, a, this is really a way to unfiat the fiat, as I, say, I keep saying, right? You get the value of the fiat without any of the constraints. But I think the good news is that uh, stable coins are, again, a natural progression. Like as uh, Rob was mentioning, if you go to the UK today, it's very hard to pay with cash. Uh, really, many companies, many shops will just not even accept cash, you know, and there's no legal requirement for them to do so, unlike in Switzerland and other places. But, and I think stable coins are the next step in terms of saying, okay, yeah, I, I as a as a retail customer, I don't understand crypto, wallet, MetaMask, and all that. I don't want to. I want something whose value doesn't increase uh, 10 10x, 20x, but doesn't decrease 10x, 20x either. Something that stays within a small range on which I can get my salary and other things paid in which I can transact. So this concept that stable coins are trying to build on is a very natural concept. And I personally think that a lot of banks will start issuing stable coins the moment central banks start giving a green light to CDBCs. So you're going to say, instead of investing in a, in a UBS bond or putting your money in UBS, you're going to buy stable coins issued by UBS, stable coins issued by uh, Credit Suisse. So I wouldn't do that personally, but you're free to do that. <laughs> um, and things like that. And the credibility of organizations will, in a certain sense, be a part of the stable definition. So I'm, again, on stable coins, I think, it's it's a bit of a wild west out there right now and a Cambrian explosion hasn't happened yet, but it will happen. And you're going to think about stable coins just like today you think about altcoins, that this is a way to do fiat without doing fiat. Okay. Now, to, just to complete the, complete the, the reality check, as I see it, maybe, uh, maybe I go to Morton so that we, on the CBD, mm -hmm. CBD uh, C side, we get the full picture. I mean, you, are, you were saying there are basically known operating so, um, yeah. is that true, Morten? Um, I think I, th I would summarize uh, CBDCs right now as a lot of talk and very little live action. So, there are a couple of uh, island nations that have issued uh, CBDCs. Um, I have a person working me for me at the, from the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, and they issued a CBDC. It was live. It had very little adoption. They got a little more adoption when they tried to do a bit of marketing, which is, I'll come back to, something very unnatural for central banks. But then the pilot has just ended, yeah. so it's actually not live anymore. Yeah. And now they're exploring, they call it Dcash, they're exploring a new version of Dcash 2.0 or whatever, and with another technology vendors using the lessons that they learned from, from this pilot. So I think there's a lot of um, uh, starts and attempts, and of course uh, China is probably the the big, biggest examples, they're running, uh, you know, experiments in cities of 10 million people and stuff like that. So, so 
I think in the retail space, yes, there is uh, small attempts. Uh, on the wholesale side, it's uh, Switzerland is leading uh, with something that they called Helvetia. That now it's the third iteration of, of this Helvetia. We were involved, the BIS Innovation Hub, in the first two iterations, and now they've gone live uh, with a wholesale CBDC using this uh, six digital exchange platform. And then there's something out in Hong Kong and a couple of other places that are also trying to use uh, wholesale. So, as I said, a uh, lot of talk, very little live action. But it looks like, therefore, it's being done very carefully, right? While on the stable coin, I would say, is the other way around. Joanna, what do you think on the stable coins? Is you, your yeah, so I mean, I think, look, I mean, for, first of all, just thinking about, you know, coexisting in a cashless society, um, I think probably many of you know, the Central Bank of Sweden had done a lot of research a number yeah. of years ago to yeah. determine that only 5% of transactions are actually done digitally. So essentially, we're already in a cashless society. It's just a matter of how we digitize. Um, and in steps DLT, CBDCs, stable coins, and so on. With stable coins, you know, obviously we've seen them just, you know, go much, much more quickly. They didn't have all of the regulatory constraints and, uh, you know, were certainly coming out of highly regula regulated institutions. Um, so USDC, I think, has actually been quite successful. Um, it's arguably the largest regulated stable coin in the world at $25 billion yeah. market cap. They're regulated by the uh, FinCEN. They, they've, uh, you know, been reporting to 46 different state regulators, um, and they have not been named by the SEC as a security. Right, so that's all positive. Um, you know, at, at $25 billion, that's pretty... You know, substantial. Tether is at about um, 100 billion, yeah. but again, not as well regulated and not necessarily yeah. as trusted. Um, so I do think there's a lot of promise with respect to stable coins, um, you know, and also all of the work that Circle has done to um, establish, you know, regulatory compliance. Yeah. Um, so that's stable coins, but I think with uh, CBDCs, um, you know, you see a lot more advancement in Europe and in Asia where there's more regulatory clarity um, with MICA, with FCA, and so on. Um, in the US, we have a lot less regulatory clarity, framework, and so on. But I think the good news is, you know, when you look at this, the, the latest stats, about 130 countries are actively exploring, either have launched CBDCs, have piloted CBDCs, or are researching CBDCs. That represents 98% of the global GDP. By contrast, in March, it was only 35 different countries, right? So, I mean, I do think we're on, you know, a pretty accelerated trajectory, at least from a research perspective. But to Morton's point, it's a lot of talk and very little action. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, that's that's because we, we have to move in parallel with the regulators and, and get them comfortable with the new technology because there are so many risks mm -hmm. with taking on something like this. Eve, would you... Complement of what has been said with other yeah, views? Yeah, what I want, just to, to make a, another view, what I would say there are in a way three types of uh, currency the CBDC wholesales, CBDC retail, mm -hmm. and stable coins actually. I think the wholesale CBDC are probably the most um, accepted. It's not a big deal because it doesn't affect you as a person. Mm -hmm. This is just a replacement or an upgrade of the financial system that exists. It means that, you know, the banks or the financial institutions which are regulated and have an account at the central bank can just get this kind of money, which in any way today, and we all remember for quantitative easing, it just it's not printed, it doesn't exist physically, it's completely digital. So the idea is just to change the infrastructure. And I think from that point of view, there is nothing uh, completely new. The only good news you can expect, you can plug it to uh, the blockchain ecosystem and have some uh, monetary policy and financial uh, stability consequences. Mm -hmm. And here there is not only a lot of talk, there is a lot of paper <laughs> written on that from you, the BIS, but also from the IMF. And then there is also transition to what retail uh, CBDC, which is essentially your cash. Mm. And we know that cash is the best ever source of, of currency you can find because it's, it has no memory, you have full anonymity, and it doesn't mean you want to do anything nasty. 
but it's always good to have a way to protect your privacy. And there is also progresses to make uh, sort of digital cast with strong uh, privacy features. And I think this is something that needs to be developed, but for the time being, it's very difficult to do that. And we know that, for example, there's some risk, like in China, that they match with your social behavior, whether you can do that. So it has a lot of implication. And I think if central bank want to provide a retail CBDC, so a digital bearer, cash equivalence, it has to be done as such. And here I think there's a lot of uh, technical issue that need to be solved. And this is really challenging. I personally much prefer to have my piece of paper, real cash, than to have a, um, a retail CBDC for the time being. Because honestly, I know that behind cash there is nothing, which is good, this is my anonymity. But uh, behind uh, all these kind of technical features, I cannot really trust. So I think there is also uh, a huge amount of work uh, to do. And regarding stable coins, I think stable coins for, for the timing, it works. It's been there, even though after uh, Terra Luna, uh, the market cap dropped quite a bit. And I just checked yesterday, it went from 185 billion to 135 today, so it's a huge drop. And Terra Luna was only 18 billion, so it doesn't explain the whole uh, drop in market capitalization. So it means there was been a lack, lack of trust, but now it is coming back again. But again, which one is used? Mainly 70% of stablecoin market cap is USDT which doesn't have the best reputation in terms of transparency, and it's mainly used within the DeFi ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So there is no, I, I think it's probably uh, too blunt, but there is no real use case for the time thing for stablecoin. And again, I think that one of the, one of the main issue, and this is, I mean, to avoid uh, money laundering, you need to have AML, you need to have a sort of KYC, know your clients, you need to have privacy features, so you need to have digital identity. Mm -hmm. And as long as you cannot uh, show who you are without telling who you are really, so having privacy features on top of that, I think stablecoin will, it would be very difficult for, for, for these kind of coins to fly uh, in the entire world. Okay, no, thank you very much. I mean, this leads very well into the, my next topic. I wanted to, to explore the use case issue and the promises that uh, stablecoins and CBDCs are giving to the society and see what uh, Morten and, 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 uh, and, and Kumardev thinks really about it. Let me just make a couple of examples. Um, I have uh, no coins and no uh, notes since three years. I have plenty of cards and I have also an app on my iPhone and uh, we have twins in Switzerland. So do you ask me do I need a, a retail uh, CBDC in Switzerland? I don't. I don't think I will, I will use it. I have enough with all this. I'm completely digital. First, first, first let's say, provocative statement. On the, on the stablecoin side, I get paid internationally when I do my job in, in fiat. Yeah. I get, you know, if I have uh, to receive 1,000 francs from, let's say, Ireland, I will get 1994 on my account three days later. So frankly, uh, what I'm telling to these this clients is you mm. buy, 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 buy a stable coin, transfer to me the stable coin, I rechange it, rechange it in fiat, I get 1,000 for 1,000 uh, in, 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 in two seconds, right? So mm. what are the use cases for CBDCs really? Are they more for the more kind of developing economies rather than mature economies? And what, what are the promises of the stable coins as well in that case? Maybe first the CBDC use case. So, so um, I think in the, in the CBDC use case, I think it's a little bit difficult in, 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 in the industrialized Switzerland, Denmark, Norway, Sweden to argue what is really the use case for retail CBDC. Uh, electronic payments works fairly well. Uh, we all pay with our phones, all this is working well. But you did point out one thing, which, you know, I can use my twin when I go to Germany or something like that. Yeah. So, so we need to connect these different systems, but that doesn't necessarily require a CBDC. The BIS Innovation Hub is working on a project called Nexus that is exactly trying to attempt to do that. Mm -hmm. But it might be that a CBDC could, could, could help there. I, th I think an interesting uh, use case is, is around what we just discussed, which is really around privacy. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Because what is weird is that a lot of people say they're very concerned about privacy, but every day you give a lot of information about your, your life by using electronic payment instruments, right? Visa, MasterCard, they pretty much know everything you do. So, and, and they can monetize that as well. So private sector companies delivering payment instruments has a reason why your information that you give to them is really valuable and they can potentially use that in different ways and can sell that on. The only entity, I would argue, that can really provide you with something that would have no incentive to use uh, uh, your, your personal information for monet monetary use or monetizing that is the central bank. So if the central bank can somehow come up with a digital payment instrument that provides the right uh, level of privacy, then you might be able, then, then that could at least be an outside option when you have to choose around different uh, payment instrument, you could choose this if you really cherish, if you really cherish privacy. And the last thing I mentioned is that's one of the things we're working on in the BIS and Innovation Hub. We just released a project called Project Tour Beyond, which is a privacy preserving form of CBDC. Mm -hmm. It only protects your privacy if you're paying, but doesn't provide, if you're receiving the money, it doesn't uh, protect your privacy. So if I pay here in the bar, uh, nobody can see that I bought a Long Island iced tea, but they can see that the bar received the money. So it would be not that they ever would, but it would be harder to evade taxes and so on and so forth. So, so there's ways that you can you can design this with cryptography that you can you can maybe find the right uh, balance between the need for privacy, but also to avoid money laundering and and terrorist financing and other things that we want to avoid. Okay, this is very good because it looks like we can, with those features, we can really make a use case attractive everywhere, right? Um, come on, Dave. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. Yeah. No, I, no, I just had to something yes, to maybe yes, add ahead, to, to what Morton was saying, right? Because there's two different perspectives. Like, you know, what what is the benefit from the central bank, but what is also the benefit from, uh, you know, the, the human being who might be benefiting from that, right? So this, for the central bank, you know, it's a little bit more transparency. It's, you know, maybe more control over monetary policy. But for, you know, the person on the ground, for example, we just went through COVID and people needed payments instantly. That was incredibly mm. full of friction um, in the U.S. and I would imagine it probably was across the world. If we were to have a central bank digital currency, that's something that could be submitted instantaneously. You get, you know, money into people's bank accounts within a day, within minutes. Um, so that's another attractive benefit for something like CBDCs. Great. Kumardev, uh, on the stablecoin this time, because you switch all with CBDC stablecoin, we proceed in parallel, eh? the, the panel in that sense. Use case and promises, hope betrayed as well, <laughs> Terra Luna. Yeah. No, absolutely. First, and one thing just to go back to Morton. So, in my last article for the Asian Banker, obviously, I, I went through the BIS Innovation Hub report. I looked through all your data and I did a summary analysis of that. And, and exactly I wrote about you know what you know the BIS Innovation Hub is looking at CDBC side and where does stablecoin add and so in effect you could download that article and <laughs> I'll give you the data uh, and now I'm looking at Project Guardian so I need to talk to you about that but um, effectively I think uh, the way I see the CDBC stablecoin discussion is really about corporate versus startup you know that that that's that for me is a very good structure. CDBCs come with institutional backing. That is it, right? So you, whatever CDBC it is, whether it's Dcash or the one that uh, you know our friends in uh, China are trying to experiment with, whatever it is, ultimately there is a government, there is institution, there is some sort of regulation. Even if there's a privacy uh, protecting uh, uh, feature, you are dealing with government and you're dealing with institutions. Stablecoin and Luna is obviously a terrible example, but Stablecoin is anybody saying, hey, if you trust me and what I'm doing and I'm pegging it to a fiat, you get all of this value management around the fiat. So long as the dollar doesn't crash, this is not going to crash. As long as this doesn't crash, this is not going to crash. But you're not, you're not dealing with government, you're not dealing with institution. You can do what you want with this, right? In a certain sense. And if you are a stablecoin issuer like Luna, for example, again, bad example, but example, you don't even share the data. Who knows what your liquidity pool is or where it is? Where it is for me is an even bigger question than what it is, right? Um, so stablecoin is basically the startup saying, don't buy a Mercedes Benz, buy uh, this car that I've built, 
uh, and it's amazing. It's better than the Benz out there. And uh, but you got to trust me, right? Now the use so the use case for this is fairly obvious. If you don't want to be dealing with the institutions of government, mm -hmm. but you still want to have the ability to do these sort of things that a CDBC potentially might allow you to do, a stable coin is a conceptually the right idea. Cross-border payments, and we're not talking about cross-border payments in industrialized nations, which is okay difficult to do but possible. Let's go to uh, places where things are not that developed. It's very hard to do cross-border payments. They still go and actually go to a money lender who will actually take your cash. I was, and I'm not even talking about, uh, you know, more deprived regions of the world. I was in the Caribbean. I was in, in, in uh, the, what's this called, the uh, St. Martin. And uh, the guy said, sorry, I'm not going to take your uh, dirhams and give you pounds because the bank over here will charge me a huge amount to convert that. And I was like, you're not kidding, are you? And you're a money, you're, you're, you're the money lender of the, and, and, but if I had a stable coin, I wouldn't care, right? I would just pay the other guy if he could accept it. So I think this, the whole point of the stable coin is you, you realize that this is a bit streetwise, that you're a bit exposed, you don't really know where the guy is there today, what the value is, what the drop is, is there a rock pool, is there a concentrated effort to move things? But it gives you convenience at a low cost, and if you are in a scenario where you need convenience at a low cost, that's an obvious use case. If you are in a scenario where privacy is super important to you and you're willing to accept volatility so long as privacy is maintained, that's an obvious use yeah. case. And I think for many individuals or people, I think stable coins are also speculative in a certain sense, depending on even if it is not as volatile as the rest, of it, it's still speculative. You could still hold on for something. It might go up, you know, five to seven percent over a month. It could happen. And that's not too bad if you're putting in certain amount of liquidity. So these are the use cases for me. But I would agree with the statement before is that I think more and more stable coins will become corporate, corporatized. You know, semi-institutions or, or large companies will start to issue stable coins, quote unquote. And uh, instead of, you know, buying a bond, a corporate bond, you're going to use their stable coins. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Very good. Um, maybe if, um, but the other should also chip in. Uh, why don't we move on to the issue of the risks um, connected with CBDCs and stable coins, and uh, therefore also to regulation, um, in the sense that I, I would like to position regulation as a way to limit the risks for the users, undue risks for the users, and also for the system at the end of the day. So, you know, CBDCs, you have a the privacy was already addressed, but this is a concern for, for the individuals, of course, but you have also technical risks. Um, so how far, you know, the technology is keep kept into, in check that it is really performing. On the, on, the, on the stable coins, we have seen everything, uh, completely unregulated stable coins, and then now I think uh, a momentum towards more regulation and banking-like regulation for the stable coins. Is that enough? Are there risks that are not covered? Uh, is the balance being taken okay, or what, what do you think? Well, well I think I, uh, there are two things that come to my mind when you uh, read this question. The first one is, uh, but it has been already, uh, we, we mentioned that this is, for you know, you know, this is a word or something which is key for us economists with the idea of singleness. Mm. Meaning that, you know, uh, for example, when you have, uh, you know, money on your account in a bank, and one dollar is one dollar and you can convert it at parity all the time to the real cash and so on. Mm -hmm. I think with stablecoin, we don't have it. There is this kind of, um, you know, it's not most of the time it's OK. You have some kind of volatility, but still it's not clean. It's not very nice. Mm -hmm. And I think it's come from uh, for two reasons. First, because you don't have uh, banks, uh, the central bank behind, which provide this stability and avoid bank run. So you need to have liquidity of last resort. And this is why CBDC, wholesale CBDC makes sense for the, the entire stability of the system. The second thing is it remind me, you know, the, the free banking episode of the 19th century in the, in the I have it in, in the US, but probably it happened in many ways, where each different banks issue their own coins. So you have, I don't know, the, I don't know, at that time we say you had the JP Morgan coin and the Morgan Stanley coin and the, and they were all dollar, but one where has more value than the other one because there was no deep pegging or just risk premium attached to it. So there is no standardization of that. And this is not good because honestly, I don't care if I got my, my Swiss franc from Credit Suisse for, for UBS. We know that Credit Suisse is dead, but still, 
one Credit Suisse deposit, uh, Swiss franc, is still uh, the same value as one UBS, uh, um, um, let's say, account. And I think this is something which is missing, and we need to have that. And if it doesn't happen, let's say, it's if not regulated, then we need to have much more transparency, like proof of reserve. Mm. But then you have also different types of currency. Some, without going into much detail, you have some, some stable coins which are more like money market funds, where actually it's just a nice way to, you know, to issue liquidity out of corporate papers. You have some other which are out of the blue, like Terra Luna, which I believe we should be extremely careful. We know how difficult it is to maintain the temperature in a room. How, how imagine how is it possible to maintain the value of a coin without anything? So I think it's uh, each time we see an algorithm, algorithmic uh, stable coin without any backing, we should be very careful in, in using that. So I think there are a few elements which are, which are absolutely key. And the, the, the second element more on here, it was more on the stable coin side. The, Something where I believe is, is very important also um, uh, for CBDC and, and for me that's linked to the regulate. It's not regulating CBDC or finding uh, a way to make it work. It's more to add the question, what does it mean if CBDC doesn't exist? My assumption is that we would not unevent crypto. DeFi will continue to explode. Luckily, for the time being, DeFi has no credit or credit is really collateralized. So it means there is no big risk. The entire financial system is based on uncollateralized credit. Mm -hmm. So on making money, most of the money that yeah. exists in the world is not from the central bank. It's private money. Mm -hmm. So DeFi will come to some credit. It will be extremely unstable as any uh, credit system, but we need it because you know you have risk on the one hand, but you have also uh, you have also growth on the other hand. So it, it's well needed. But when you have that, you will have a big bankruptcy, and um, it will happen maybe on Sunday morning when you are eating your uh, your croissant with your with your coffee, and if you call your central and say, "Oh, sorry, you know this is the hotline," we will call you back on Monday morning at eight. That's too late. The whole uh, the whole system works. So for me here, there is a need for uh, a CBDC to uh, come to uh, get ready for the instability, which is not a, which I don't see in a negative way, but for the instability of the financial system. So I think that on the one hand, uh, we need to have also uh, so we, we need we need to have CBDC which are ready for that and central bank obviously BIS is playing a key uh, key role here with the IMF as well on creating this sort of money. But I think we should have this in mind because this is absolutely key for our future for the stable coin. And at the end of the day, also for simple things like international payments, because I, I have a the, I have a sister-in-law uh, uh, living in Norway. Sometimes I need to pay money. Norway is kind of a well-developed country. It costs me a hand each time I want to to send money. It cannot be. It cannot be. Paid. What do we do? I wait until she comes and I give her cash. <laughs> should not be the case. You know. Okay. Come on. Yeah. So I think you know we we should think about uh, all these development also in this context. What yeah. if we didn't? We don't do anything. I you, you brought up fantastic points. I wonder whether the other panelists have something to add to that. I mean, I, I think I would echo the the issue around, you know, what we saw in 2022 for consumers in terms of overall risks, right? Celsius went down, Voyager went down, BlockFi, um, so many others, but Terra Luna was horrible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for the mainstream consumer, they don't understand what the difference between an algorithmic stable coin is versus an actual asset backed and regulated stable coin like USDC. And so they watched, you know, so many gains, I don't know, thousands of gains just go rock bottom all the way down to zero. And that's going to take a while to recover from. And, you know, the, the general public just isn't going to, to understand those nuances. So I think education is going to be critical. And I think also, you know, thinking about both stable coins, but also um, CBDCs, there's just other things that we need to be thinking about. There's potential runs on the bank, which could preclude uh, banks from being able to lend. Um, it could also be, you know, very problematic for uh, underfinanced uh, economies. 
there's um, cybersecurity attacks, there's privacy and AML. Um, so, so many different things to, to be considering in, in thinking about um, really being risk proof as we go forward. And so, you know, therefore it's understandable that it's taken so long because there's technical aspects of this, to, there's legal aspects to this, there's consumer protections. And, you know, it's essentially, it has to be all hands on deck and all different types of expertise to really mm -hmm. solve the problem. Martin, any views on that? Also, a uh, lot of things to to unpack, but but just on on, on stable coins. So yep. I think I think we agree. There's a lot more action here, but but for me, it's more is it the kind of action that we want as a society. I think there's some really good use cases. People have touched upon them around cross-border payments. The World Bank is using stable coins to get money into really difficult places like Ukraine and stuff like that. And that 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 is all great, but then. Why are people willing to hold tether when you can earn four or five percent? Right? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the, there are some other use cases that are just not great, and I think it's on incumbent on the industry to try and figure out how to separate the good and the bad use cases. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. But also, just to be clear, I probably said this in the beginning. I don't think it's a fair fight, and a little bit it's a corporate between the startup. Uh, I used to work at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and you walk into the entrance and in the limestone with golden letters, it says that the role of the Federal Reserve is to furnish an elastic currency. Mm. And there's no way that the stable coin can do that. And so, so it's, it's, not, it's not a fair fight. There are gonna be a lot of uh, interesting use cases for stable coins where they can, if they stay ahead and the technology is better than uh, what central banks provide, then I think they can still have a, a role in the market. It's my job to make sure that that gap between where the private sector is and the central banks are is as mm -hmm. narrow as possible. So it's a bit on whether I can figure out to do my job. But I think, so, so I think that's the case, but, but I don't think in the long term, uh, stable coins, stable coins like cash is not the answer to the future of money, neither is stable coins. Just to be Sorry, yeah. I don't know if I have time. I just want to come back a little bit on what you said um, and not to... Uh, I would say two things about this. One, and I think it's fundamentally very important, is that who here believes that they can actually control the central bank of their country with their vote? Nobody, right? And uh, if you are Greek, uh, you, would, you would all know that uh, when the Greek banks stopped for 10 days, just like that, there was no parliamentary resolution, nothing, they, you know, just stopped. If you had 1,150,000 in your bank on the day that the bank closed, and the day it opened 10 days after, you had 100,000. Mm. And you could go do whatever you wanted. You could, you know, go to any court on the planet, jump off any cliff you want. The, the Greek state said, this is it. It's been decided by the ECB, and uh, it's been decided by Europe, and that's your one million is gone. So I don't buy this idea that uh, that a central bank guarantees parity or value of your money. That's nonsense. This is just it's just the system is existing today, and it's running today, and that's and that's the only reason why it's there because they are, they control the power kegs, right? The same thing about value of dollar. This is again nothing. If you had a hundred dollars and you put it in a safe twenty years ago, and you took it out today. What you could buy with $100 20 years ago, you cannot buy today by far. You will need $1,000 or more. So the, so the idea that there's parity and value and stability is, again, nonsense. I'm sorry, because this has no value at all. It is just that the system m makes that unstability look less, look more stable by trying to have a sort of soft devaluing so that you don't get the impact every day. But if you came back to this same Davos shop next, uh, Davos bar, X bar next year and tried the same coffee, I would bet you it will cost you more. The same exact same coffee in dollar terms. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is, these are not arguments for me, right? And the stable coin argument, it, the thing that is volatile, is more immediate. It can happen more rapidly. But the principle is the same, is that value comes from what you think is value, is what you, what you uh, intend as value. So the question is, do I want to have my uh, perception of value and, and trade with the community of those who have a similar perception? Or do I want one person or one government or one sort of institution to decide for me and for everybody else what the value is of an asset that I hold? So if you go to Argentina, all that talk about central bank, Argentinians, it's, it's worth nothing. Inflation is worth completely nothing. So the new guy who's a bit off the track, but he, he says, listen, we're just going to dollarize because our currency is worth nothing. 
And that's not the only case. So if you look back at the last 100 years, there are many Terra Lunas in the central bank world and in the, in the currency world. So it's nonsense to say that, you know, because uh, stable coins are unstable, CDBCs are, and central banks are, well, it's not. It's just not. It's just that these are power structures and there's an illusion that we can control these power structures through our voting, but it's not true. Okay. We can't. Yeah. We don't. But this is very, uh, I like that. But more than you want to do. No, I, I just like. want to say that uh, money, money is about trust at the end, and and so, but stablecoin doesn't solve any of the issues that you raise. They they have the same. If you if you back a stablecoin by the dollar, well, if it's the, the trust in the dollar goes, so goes your stablecoin. So I don't think I don't think I. So actually, I, I agree with you, but I, I just want to say the stablecoin solves none of the the issues. That yeah, you today, but it will change. You will have yeah. stablecoins that are not dollar backed but asset backed. Yeah, but then it's the issue coin. of the asset and stuff. I yeah, think. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Trust is key. I agree with Sorry. you on that. I think trust is key. I'm just not comfortable with the fact that trust should be by mandate. I think trust should be earned and you should be able to trade in that trust. That's where I'm sort of coming from. Okay. And if, I just want to come yes, back to sorry, the yes. of the Greek bank because indeed it, it occurred, but I think it's both correct and wrong what you say in the sense that indeed if you had money on this account, which is a deposit, which is not central bank money, then you, you only had a tenth of what you had before. But if you have this uh, 1 million, 100,500 in cash, 10 days after, the value would have been the same. Mm. Uh, because it's still cash, you know, you, you have the money. The euro is euro, and that's it. Meaning, I think this is also just to be, not all the money are the same. There's a clear hierarchy of money. Some are better than the other one. And in, a normal, in normal times, you completely forget. We believe that, you know, a bank will never be, uh, will never have any issue. So we believe that the, the money I have on my account is the same I have on, on deposit, on, on um, I mean, in cash. And then suddenly we have a bank run. There was last year in, in the US and we realized. So I think we have also to be precise when we talk about money, about what type of money we discuss. I think it's, uh, I understand your point. I think we have to be careful with everyone. I fully agree with you. But I think also we need to be clear about the, the, the sort of money that exists. Very good. Okay. Now, now I want to do still two things with the time that is left, <laughs> so 12 minutes. Maybe we should divide the time into two. Uh, first part, I do want to address a question that uh, I find it fascinating, which is uh, what do you think is going to happen? So it's purely speculative discussion, but we have on the side of the CBDCs, on the side of the stablecoin, it's really a phase where you know, creativity, experiment, thousand flowers are blooming, but at the end of the day, there will be some, uh, some, some end game or temporary end game. What do you think this is going to be? I mean, will we end up in having something, a, a, a third phase, something completely new out of these two momentum? Are we going to see one taking over the other or eliminating the other or cannibalizing the other? Are we, and this is what I hope, f find a way to make these two things cooperating? I mean, one example that is always in my mind, the CBDCs, even in the retail version, they can cope today, I think, as far as I'm informed, with cross-border payment. So why don't take the best out of both? So the CBDCs are good for domestic payments. The stable coins can help in making the cross-border payment more efficient. Why you just, I don't know, make synergies and use both of, both, both of these? So this is just to set the scene, but I would like really to know your views of each of you as, you know, where, where the game is going is gonna to go here. And then I would suggest that in the second five, last five minutes that will, uh, will be available, we open it up for some questions because the discussion was very rich. I'm sure you have some questions. But first, let's look in the crystal ball. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to start. Um, look, I, I, I don't I, I don't necessarily see a complete convergence where this, there's this end game and there's this winner. Um, I, I do think that there's a world where stable coins and CBDCs coexist, just like Bitcoin and ETH and other cryptocurrencies are going to coexist. Um, you're always going to have the retail segment, you're going to have the DeFi DGENs, you're going to have the speculators, you're going to have people who are wanting to be creative and innovative in, you know, the different types of technologies that they can build. Yeah. Um, CBDCs, 
you know, might actually help them augment that because it, you know, lends credibility to the overall space. Um, so when they want to trade different things, hopefully they can, you know, take their CBDCs, whatever their, you know, C, uh, you know, central bank backed U.S. dollar, for example, and then trade it on, you know, a digital rail for Bitcoin, mm -hmm. for ETH, or whatever it is. Um, does it have to be just CBDC? stable coins and you know there's just one specific use case for each maybe not i mean i think cbdc's obviously are much much lower uh, much higher volume therefore wholesale um, use cases so they have kind of their lane to operate within but stable coins I don't necessarily see a world where they have to be cannibalized. Maybe, you know, a large majority of them will be, just mm -hmm. like we saw with ICOs and so on. But there's probably a world where these these coexist, just like you know the the very um, sort of um, I don't know persistent cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and ETH yeah. have persisted as well. So coexistent thesis, Martin, coexistence. Uh, I would say, I think we are entering into a new area of uh, currency competition, mm -hmm. so which we had seen historically. What, but for the last uh, many decades, like the central bank had a monopoly on issuance of, of cash. Uh, that doesn't translate into the digital world. So if the central banks issues uh, a digital instrument, all of a sudden there will be competition from, from the private sector. So that's an entirely new world for central banking. Central banks need to, how do you market your products? You know, we didn't have to think about that before. So, so I think that's going to be a, a big challenge for, for central banks. If competition and coexistence, what do you add? Well, I think that if you look at the um, entire history of um, money, I mean, it's a, there have been always innovation. There have been, it's a mix between innovation, between technology, and uh, also what is accepted by, by the public. Because at the end of the day, the trust is also, you know, I trust in currency because I know you accept it, so it's kind of a common trust. I think this competition, I mean, economy, so competition is good, and probably it will also uh, encourage a central bank to provide kind of a good, good type of money. But I think at the end of the day, you know, it's like, I don't know, I'm, I'm thinking about internet doesn't kill uh, television, television didn't, didn't kill radio, uh, radio didn't kill book. So I think at the end of the day, we'll have a multiplicity of forms of money. So I'm not really afraid of uh, not having any cash in my pocket soon. Mm -hmm. Your views? So there's two things here that I think are important to separate. One is what you were saying about technology. I think absolutely. We have entered a new era of financial technology. And the innovation that it is unleashing cannot be put back in the box. Mm -hmm. So are we going to have uh, stable coins in one form or the other, asset-backed, fiat by whatever? Are we going to have new ways of making payments that do not go to intermediaries at all, even if things crash? Absolutely. Are central banks going to deploy new technology? Absolutely. I don't see how that's not going to happen, especially for central banks in smaller countries because they have to stay relevant. And they have to do what the consumer is doing, right? So they, they cannot be on a, on a system that 90% of their consumers or their customers are not. Um, so we are going to have new technologies in payments. We're going to have innovation in that. Are we going to have a convergence? It's a very good question. I think the convergence is to me more a political question than a technology one. I think this is where governments and societies will have to decide that should these two things be linked or should they stay separate? And I think the answer will not be uniform across the world. In larger economies, it might not make sense to do that, but in the smaller economies, it might make sense to do that because the private money might be 90% of the economy. So in that scenario, it might make sense. So I think here, what we will see is first of all, an adoption rate where smaller countries, smaller economies will start to do both mm -hmm. to reduce the cost of transaction, increase flexibility and offer an attractive uh, inward investment policy. And I think that um, the larger countries will take some time. I don't know, there was a gentleman here on Monday who said, uh, Canada still doesn't use IBAN, and if you want to buy something on stocks, it takes two weeks for the stock to turn up in your account. I was surprised to hear that. But there's a reason for that. The Canadian system works on that. Why would they change? What is driving it, right? So there will always be those countries, larger economies, which will say, no, 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 we don't want to deploy 
any convergence between these two, any standardization between these two, it doesn't make sense. But the fast, the smaller and more agile ones, like in UAE, who come up with a regulatory framework on VARA and others, they will absolutely do that. Great, thank you for these views. Um, yeah, I would like to open it up to the audience because you know the discussion has been very rich, number one, and we have here really speci specialist people. So. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the conversation. Very interesting. I'm curious about um, uh, asset-backed uh, stable coins and perhaps a question for the moderator. What do you think about uh, uh, stable, <laughs> <I didn't expect laughs> that. Okay. stable coins that are backed by different basket of uh, goods or yeah, assets yeah. or minerals like we were talking about yesterday? Yeah. yeah. So in general, what type of other stable coins you see in future could uh, gain traction? Yeah, no, thanks. It's true that I spend um, some time, professional time, in dealing with the stable coins. Um, in fact, I, I uh, helped uh, the issuance of a stable coin, which is based, which is backed by five metals, and there is therefore a portfolio effect uh, around it, uh, and the, a huge stability in value. Is, by the way, it's called the Edel coin. Huge stability in value because those metals are not volatile at all. Um, during long periods, and then they step up in value when the valuation every uh, every three months kicks in. So it's really an attractive stable coins if you want to perform transactions on the blockchain because you don't have this minute volatility that you, you experience with the, the stable coin backed by, yeah. by fiat or by gold. And at the same time, you can actually maybe get some, some return over time. So for me, the stable coin based by fiat, it's, it's, it's not very interesting because you go back to the fiat. I mean, the only advantage that you get Correct. is the technical advantage. Again, my transaction, I get the money immediately and I get it in full without giving out money along the way and it takes four days to come to me. That, that is good. Otherwise, you are actually exposed to the, to the, to the, to the fiat uh, purchasing power loss, for instance, and you are exposed, which is crucial. You are exposed to the bad investment that the holder of your fiat that you deposit to get the stable coin, um, uh, the bad investment that can take place. We have experienced that with, uh, with um, the USDC, for instance, where it was enough the rumor that 2% uh, of, the, of the reserve was being lost in, yeah. in, 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 this, in the San Francisco, in the California, right, for, for, for the peg to be lost. So I think it's much more original to get uh, to get to another back in in terms of metals, for instance. Even though having said that, you still don't get rid of the fiat because all the metals are still also valued at the end of the day in US dollar. Yeah. On the maybe my last word on the stable coin that are uh, based on algorithm. This, frankly, I, I put a cross on that. I mean, this doesn't make any sense. I mean, I come from an experience in my past uh, life as a banker that I really experienced on my skin, not fortunately, I mean, in the sense of the skin of the bank, <laughs> the, the failure of the models in connection with the subprime crisis. Hmm. I mean, you bake, you bake a, a stable coin with an algorithm, it means you bake the stable coin on a model. Now, the model works until Everything work. that it has foreseen in the assumption work. Then you have the you have an event yeah. out of the of this realm, and yeah. then your model performs badly, and you lose everything. This is what happens when you bake your mm. stable coins by a model. Sorry, I'm a bit excited because this is really very important for me as well. I don't know if you want to add actually something on that. <laughs> you are the speakers, not me. Nothing. Other question. Um, it's a topic that Joanna touched a bit, but it was written in a academic article um, authored by a Finnish, Swedish and a Turkish academic, mm -hmm. the case for CBDCs, and they mentioned something interesting. Uh, coming to Joanna's point of uh, using it as a monetary policy, you touched that, uh, yes, stimulus checks were sent by mail, it could have been done, uh, but they also highlight another topic, CBDC is also a programmable money. So the uh, government yes. of, of, uh, of the nations who gave stimulus checks could have programmed negative interest rates on it in order to encourage people to spend it, or yes. they could have put restrictions on them yes. to be used for basic needs. So we actually missed that out by the governments not 
using CBDCs at the time when it was most needed. So, Joanna, maybe you just comment on it. Very, Programmability very is a fantastic um, point. Thank you for yeah, bringing it up. Yeah. Very good point. I mean, it, it's a double-edged sword, right? Because so it, it provides the government with, you know, essentially a lot of power to, uh, you know, instantaneously get money to people, you know, and you mentioned programmable money, so we can talk about, uh, you know, increasing interest rates, decreasing interest rates, and so on. Um, you know, and, and distribution accordingly. Uh, you know, that's that's one side of the coin, but the other, you know, negative side of the coin is they have complete track of all of the money that you own. And so therefore, if you own taxes, they can just take it out of your wallet. So, you know, I, I, I see it as a double-edged sword. I think I see it as, um, you know, a, a really attractive proposition, I think, for central banks, possibly for individuals, but not necessarily in every way. That's what I would add to that. Yep. Just very quickly, if money is programmable, it might not be even be money. So that's something to think about. And if central banks does anything else than move around either the, the amount of money or the price of money, then it becomes fiscal policy. So I think that those should be separate. So what you're talking about is more akin to food stamps, where you, for example, restrict the, the thing. So it's more vouchers. It's really not money. So just to be clear. Um, good. We are coming to the end of this session. That is a question. Um, yeah, if you have time, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, one yeah, more question. We can we? <laughs> let's take other questions. Sure. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Valerian, uh, IT investor from Ukraine. Uh, just uh, one quick comment about one of the panelists said that uh, it's a difficult place to send money to, so we have to use stable coins. Uh, I can say that Ukrainian banking system is working perfectly and uh, we have a lot of businesses there and you could send uh, fiat too. But the question is different. So. Um, uh, the question is, you know, that uh, many companies starting to pay their contractors in uh, stable coins. And uh, uh, the question is that, and we are backing up a few uh, product companies which are making that easier than just sending from wallet to wallet, right? What is your opinion on in which countries you could see the trend of companies switching from paying with the fiat to stable coins? Uh, or whether you actually see this trend or it's too early? Thank you. I know that at, so I, before DTCC, just about six months ago, I was at Consensus and they desperately wanted to pay people in Ethereum. Everybody wanted to be paid in Ethereum. And in the early days of Consensus, they were actually paid in Ethereum, but it's, it's really a regulatory question. Um, they had to stop it because of regulatory constraints. So, um, you know, I think companies would probably be attracted to that proposition and probably employees would be attracted to that proposition, but it's, you know, really the, the major blocker is in legality of the whole thing. Any other view or any other question? Yes? Two other questions, yeah. It's good we got the audience animated. Yeah. Rob, Thank Rob you. you tell me when, yeah. It's very encouraging to see uh, your opinions regarding uh, central bank currencies that can be highly manipulated and that's not money. Um, my question is more for uh, Mr. Bech and Longchamp, you have a significant concern for privacy, which is very nice to see. Um, I don't know your familiarity with um, GNU Thaler, um, since you mentioned some of the key aspects of that. And if you are, maybe can you give us a little bit of insight where you see that project going and how um, you might see that being a successful part of a move towards the CBCDs or um, it, are there other alternatives to that? Um, so very, very quickly, I'm very familiar with the, with the, with the project. I, I think it's a very interesting project, just like our project, which is similar. There's a long way to go. There's a lot of issues that still need to, to, to be figured out, but I, I definitely think it's a very interesting, I think it's an interesting direction of travel and it's definitely something uh, that we should investigate more, and I, I wish them the best. So, <laughs> good. Yeah. Sure. Hi, my name is Victor. I'm an advisor in the space since a while now, since seven years. I have a question for Johanna and for Martin. Do you plan to issue an ISIN number for Bitcoin or for any digital assets, or is that a, is it because all the ETFs has an ISIN number? Do you plan to do that for the cryptocurrencies as well? 
Thank you. For the Bitcoin ETF, I know in um, the U.S. at least we're we're issuing QSIPs. Um, so that is that is definitely something that we're moving toward, especially now that the SEC has approved the Bitcoin ETF. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. One here. Hello, good morning, everybody. Uh, going back uh, one second to the regulation, uh, we know that the European Commission, with the last mega regulation, introduced a cap to the stable coins not pegged to euro, to one million transaction, and to 200 million of uh, total volume. Yeah. Uh, nowadays, uh, the, the most important stable coins are not pegged to euro, and that's I think will impact a lot in uh, in the European market. Just to to have an opinion. Yeah. Good from question. No, I think uh, excellent and goes back to the, what that gentleman was saying and what you said is that the discussion that we didn't have today because there wasn't time is a policy effect of this. Policies, uh, central bank policies, governmental policies, uh, fiscal policies have a, will have a lot of effect on how CDBCs and stable coins are perceived. If my money is programmable, it means it can be taken out of my hands at any moment in time. Okay, that's not money. I agree with you completely. Yeah. Uh, in the same way, if uh, and, and you know, uh, <laughs> being in Belgium, which is where we get taxed uh, even for breathing, um, <laughs> so uh, which is probably we get taxed for breathing. Uh, in uh, you know, the idea that you have a cap is just a complete misunderstanding of how this market works, right? So what does that mean? There will be very few stable coins back to the euro, and that is the actual goal. That's what they don't want to have euro stable coins because then you will have more forward thinking nations within the bloc, such as Malta, uh, saying, oh, let's do it, right? And, and, and they don't, we don't, you will find that hard to control because they equal votes. So, uh, but what does that mean? It means that policy is actually an arbitrage. Policy is a competitive aspect of this whole game. You have other smaller nations saying, hello, we are very policy friendly towards this, no cap. You can, I remember this discussion 30 years ago about FDI. Many nations said, oh, you can invest in the country, but you can't take money out like that. And China said, take whatever you want. I think the rest is history. Yeah? So policy plays a very important role. And absolutely, I agree with you that I think the whole stable coin CDBC debate will actually be driven more by policy than technology innovation and uh, the demand for it in the market. <laughs> 